All right. Good afternoon. Everyone. Uh, good Carlos. evening. Welcome every minutes for people to to log in, and then we'll get started with with today's uh, dialogue. Uh, I think we're, we're, we've got about 75, 76 people on, so let's go ahead and get started. There's a lot to talk today. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, my name is Carlos Del Rio. I'm a professor of medicine, uh, epidemiology, and global health at Emory University, and I am delighted to be joined by my colleagues, uh, Peter Chin Hong from UCSF and Bonnie Maldonado from Stanford. Uh, we have been doing these webinars now for, I guess, uh, I don't know, probably about a year, and they have been incredibly informative, and I think audience have, have liked them. Uh, this webinars have typically been uh, moderated by our colleague and good friend, uh, Paul Wolverding, but Paul is in a much, uh, much needed uh, and well-deserved vacation in, in the Middle East, and therefore he is unable to join us tonight, and I will be then uh, moderating uh, this, uh, this session. You know, today is, is April twentieth, uh, so we are now well into the third third year of this pandemic. And today, uh, this week, the WHO said that the COVID pandemic still remains volatile, uh, with the virus likely causing further trouble before it settles into a predictable pattern. Uh, WHO has uh, noted that in the past twenty eight days, uh, twenty three thousand people worldwide have died of COVID. And about uh, 3 million new cases have been reported. And this is in the setting of much lower testing and reporting. In the US, COVID-19 remains a leading cause of death with an average of about 245 deaths per day, primarily among older adults and those who are immunocompromised and frequently not boosted. Uh, additionally, uh, SARS-CoV-2 continues to mutate with the Omicron uh, subvariant XBB.1.16 which was first detected in India earlier this year, now counting for more than 7% of cases in the US, and another Omicron subvariant, the XBC.1.6, which is a combination of the Delta and the Omicron variants of concerns first detected in South Australia, where it has caused a wave of hospitalizations, could provide a competition. So we continue to see uh, Omicron evolving. So I'm gonna start first by asking about, about these new variants. Uh, what do we know about them uh, and how, uh, you know, we read reports that they tend to cause more, a different presentation with conjunctivitis in kids. So maybe Bonnie, can you tell us more about these new variants? Uh, yeah, sorry, my computer just shut down, so I'm on my phone. <laughs> I'm trying to. Yeah, so uh, we, it's really interesting to see how quickly these variants spread. So we, as you heard, we started hearing reports, especially in India, about this particular variant, and in particular for children, what was noted. Uh, was that it was causing what looked like adenovirus pink eye, especially in children with sticky pink eyes. Uh, we don't know how infectious those were, but presumably it, it could be as infectious as, as uh, COVID would be normally. Um, and we were starting to hear about um, remasking uh, and some lockdowns in India because of the surges due to this particular virus, but we didn't hear much about the hospitalizations or death issues. Now, what we're seeing a week ago, because I was preparing a separate talk for work, I looked at the data and we did not have detects last week for this virus in the US. And, to, and yesterday we did find that now, lo and behold, about 7% of the cases of the of viruses that are being identified in the US are now XBB.1.16. So we are starting to see it in the US. It um, is, it's really disseminated across all parts of the country, although some areas are reporting more than others. But we're not hearing, again, as Carlos alluded to, we're not hearing about any unusual uh, repercussions regarding uh, hospitalizations and deaths. It's really probably, as we see with these variants, more transmissible. So that's where we are now, and it'll probably be the next variant du jour, and hopefully won't be uh, any more virulent than what we're seeing lately. Yeah, well, thank you, Bonnie. Uh, you know, the other thing that happened uh, this week is that the FDA uh, sort of went ahead and issued a statement trying to simplify COVID vaccinations. And then the ACIP met, met yesterday and discussed the update on COVID. And then uh, today, the CDC has come up with, with updated, basically pretty much endorsing what the FDA had said and what the, FDA, F, you know, the ACIP had agreed upon. And I think it simplifies a lot what we need to do with, with COVID vaccinations, with boosting. I think one of the things that is pretty clear is that the monovalent vaccines are, are no longer uh, useful 
and uh, in most in most circumstances. And so, Peter, what what how do you interpret what are you hearing, and how what are you telling your patients? So I'm telling them basically, uh, the older you are, the more important it is to get a booster if you have not had one in four months, which is for most people who are older who have gotten it, they've gotten it um, back in the fall of last year. Um, and for immune compromised individuals, I think we are always felt nervous about them. Um, and you know now the CDC and ACIP is giving more an FDA giving more leeway to clinicians to really make determination. And they've said, you know, if you have not had one in the last two months, you can get one, but also waiting for, for bodies and, and, you know, expert groups to come together for more precise guidelines. The third thing, as you said, Carlos, is the simplification. No more um, original formulation of the vaccine, uh, just the bivalent booster. And probably the most controversial part of the guidelines is, or the, 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 is the statement is that you know, you don't need uh, two shots if you've never been vaccinated. You just need one uh, bivalent booster. I think many ID folks are a little bit nervous about that, but understand the need for simplification. Yeah, but I, what I would add to that, Peter, is that most people who haven't been vaccinated have already been infected. Mm -hmm. So in a way, they're getting a vaccine, a, a bivalent booster on top of their, their naturally acquired infection. So in a way, I, I don't disagree with it. What, what I see, though, is a little more complex, a little more confusing to me, or maybe because I'm not a pediatrician, is the guidelines for children. And they still remain complicated with recommendations varying by age, vaccine, what shots you previously received. And, and really, we haven't heard anything from CDC or anybody about what to do with children under the age of six. So, Bonnie, you, yeah. you're an expert in this. Can you tell us what to what to tell my grandchildren? Yeah, well, I'll tell you, it is a lot easier now than it was uh, yesterday, because before yesterday, we had 11 different flavors of vaccines for kids under 18, five for uh, Moderna and six for Pfizer, depending on how old you were when you first got your first dose. And so, and different colored vials and different colored labels. So you might have a purple label or a maroon label. And so actually now getting rid of all the monovalence is actually going to streamline it for us. And you're right, pediatricians are very good at this. And we did a little survey last week. I did grand rounds here at Stanford. And we talked to our pediatricians and they said, oh yeah, we're, we're fine with this. this is actually gonna make it easier for us. So I think it'll mostly be messaging to our pediatric colleagues to make sure they know how to do this. And as you know, part of it has to do with the regulatory piece, right? So Moderna used a different cutoff in age. They went to four years of age, whereas Pfizer went up to five. So for the four to five-year-olds, there's differences between whether you're on Pfizer or Moderna, but the pediatric, you know, we in pediatrics are always used to pivoting with vaccines. So I think this is, a little easier for us to deal with, but hopefully in the future, it'll get even simpler because right now, unfortunately, we still need a three dose series uh, with uh, for the Pfizer vaccine in the young kids compared to the Moderna two dose. And that's just how it's gonna be for a while. Yeah, and I, I still think that the uh, uh, the recommendations uh, as complicated as they are, still they're still simpler than than the recommendations on how to use the pneumococcal vaccines. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, I mean, you know, when you you know, as uh, you know, for all of us following this data, it, it takes a, it used to take up all our day just to figure out, you know, for each individual patient. So I think we're getting we're getting to where we should be, which is we're starting to streamline and taper back down. And I agree with Peter um, that you know the booster data is, you know, it is a little, it's still unclear where we're going to head with that, but I think we're headed in the right direction. And clearly the data demonstrate, as we all know, that if you ha are unboosted, but vaccinated, you're still almost three times more likely to be hospitalized or die than if you have a booster. So I think the data still is, is still pretty strong. No, it's, I think it's really absolutely very strong. You, you need to be boosted. And to me, my biggest concern is that only about 16% of the total U.S. population has been has received their first booster, and uh, and of those over the age 65, the ones I worry about most, only about 46% of them have received their first booster. So we really still have a, a ways to go to get people boosted. You know, people are getting infected, and and they will be get infected. And if you're infected and you're vaccinated, you're going to do okay, and you're likely you're you know vaccinated and boosted, you're going to do okay. You're not going to get sick. You're not going to end up in the hospital. Likely, you're not going to die. But people are still concerned about, about the possibility of getting long COVID 
And, and the questions that we frequently get is about treatment. So, so Peter, can you update us about what are you telling people about, about therapy for, you know, somebody, you know, 72 year old person calls you and says, you know, I just got diagnosed with COVID. I feel fine. It feels like a mild cold. Uh, what do, should I do? Well, without skipping a beat, Carlos, I would uh, really try to get them on Paxlovid uh, for a variety of reasons. Um, first of all, they may not have, I don't know uh, when they've received their last booster. Um, hope, you know, even if it were in the fall, that immunity might have waned by now. Uh, we know from the data presented from the CDC or ACIP in February that uh, the most pronounced decline in antibodies are in those over 65 at the four month mark. Uh, so Paxlovid within the first three to five days uh, would cut down the need for host uh, risk of hospitalization, even in those who are vaccinated, uh, could potentially cut down the risk of long COVID. Uh, and, um, you know, so that, that is the, one, the first thing. And of course, with that, I'd want to know what their kidney function is or, and if they're, what other drugs they're taking for drug interactions. If they are on absolute contraindications, the other two options would be remdesivir for three days, which would probably be, you know, if logistically possible, something I would recommend. You kind of have a, a window of seven days for this study. Um, and, and of course, molnupiravir, which is probably the third option um, because uh, only 30% efficacy, but there are a bunch of uh, drugs in the pipeline uh, that that uh, are coming up that could, you know, uh, I think be competition to Paxlovid, and that'll be interesting to see how that uh, plays out. Yeah, thank you very much. That's that's very useful. Uh, Bonnie, how about how about in, in kids? What are you telling young people? What are you telling them if they get infected? Yeah, well, let me start off to add to what Peter said, because absolutely he's right. I mean, I, uh, I think if you see adults um, who haven't, who are infected and feel fine, the problem is you just don't know who's going to have long COVID. And well, let's talk with the adults first, because um, we're still getting lots of referrals from colleagues and friends who are saying, I have a friend or I, I myself have long COVID and I don't know where to go. I don't know what to do. There was a recent uh, review about the recover trials and others and how uh, well we're doing. And it's still taking us a while to figure that out. So Paxlovid actually does seem to slow the, or reduce the risk of developing long COVID. So that in itself is a really good reason to, um, to consider using it. And I think one of the points that you made, Carlos, about infection, as we said, uh, one of my colleagues said way at the beginning of, the, uh, at the beginning of vaccination, the point of vaccines is very different for different diseases. In this case, we're not going to prevent infection. So I think we need to get past that. We're gonna to continue to see infection. What we're trying to do, as we've always said, I think is we're trying to reduce hospitalizations and deaths. And I think we're getting there. We're not as close as we'd like to be, but with Paxlovid, the, the, what we're trying to do there is not to turn negative faster, although that could be nice, it's really to make sure that people don't develop long COVID. That, that's no guarantee, but it does seem to reduce the risk. So now in kids, there are some studies. There's one good study that was done with a group called PEDSNET. And this is a, a, um, a network of several uh, U.S. children's hospitals. And they uh, followed uh, several thousand kids over a period of time. This is a retrospective study. And it was case, basically a case a test negative study where they compared kids who had a, a, a COVID positive test versus kids who did not have a COVID positive test. And they looked at, they matched the kids and they tracked them for a period of time uh, for a year, um, up to a year after they got the test results. And they looked into the medical records to see what happened to these kids. And of course, being children, there were a lot of kids who had COVID-like uh, or what we could consider uh, long COVID type symptoms, such as fatigue and persistent fevers and other neurologic findings. Uh, but these were common in both test negative kids as well as test positive kids. But the kids who had um, were test positive were 4% more likely. So that the effect size was 4% difference between the positive and the negative kids. So the, the takeaway here is that kids are very unlikely to develop long COVID when you compare them to kids who had other symptoms that weren't related to COVID, but were similar symptoms to what the COVID kids had. 
they were 4% risk of having these. And they lasted for at least six months. We don't know anything beyond that period of time. Um, and most of them were things like fatigue um, and some cardiovascular, but very, very low on the cardiovascular, mostly fatigue. Um, and they were also more likely to occur in kids who had been hospitalized in the ICU. So those were kind of the major findings. And that's the best data we have so far. Yeah, you know, it's, it's, a, it's really an issue, but again, I, I emphasize it. I, I don't get tired of saying it. You're vaccinated, you're boosted. Many people have actually already been infected, so they have hybrid immunity. If you're in that position, yeah, COVID may be you know, a nuisance, but in general, you're gonna do okay. We're seeing that. I mean, I think what I'm seeing still in the hospital is people in the ICU or dying who are old or immunosuppressed or who did not get, are old and did not get boosted. And I think we really need to do a better job of, of getting people over 65 boosted. And hopefully this new FDA recommendation will help us do that. I wish it was a Medicare, uh, you know, requirement because at that, that point in time, you get a lot of people who are 65 are vaccinated, like we've done with other things. Uh, so let's let's move on to talk about about what what else is happening out there, right? Uh, we have, uh, uh, you know, what what is going to be what's going to keep us up uh, this this uh, this summer? And we have Marburg. So what what do we know about Marburg virus? What do we know about the outbreak? And what do we need to be concerned about? Yeah, um, so, Bonnie, you want to start? Yeah, so um, this takes me back to the uh, days before COVID when we had Ebola. And uh, I remember the very first time we had a graduate student who we thought had been traveling through an Ebola region, had just come back and had a fever, came into the ED, and everyone was in a, uh, they were really scared. And we, you know, I came in with my infection control team, and we kind of organized, uh, you know, what to do. Obviously, we had isolated the patient, but we we, you know, we quickly got a history from the person and it, you know, over time it became very clear she did not have Ebola, uh, but we still kept her isolated till we got, you know, some testing done. But the thing that we um, understood here is that not only had she been traveling through an Ebola region, but she had also been through a region that when I looked it up was at risk for Marburg. So on my list was Ebola and Marburg and they're related viruses, right? They're in the hemorrhagic fever category, which are really dangerous pathogens. The r naughts, by the way, are low, but the transmission modalities are very risky because there are secretions and people handling these patients can be at risk. So the current outbreak is worrisome for a number of reasons. First of all, it's in Equatorial Guinea, which is in Central, South, Central Africa. It's just south of Cameroon and near Gabon and, and south of Nigeria. So it's kind of in the central coastal area, uh, just north of the equator. And the problem there is we have 11 confirmed cases so far. Two of them are in healthcare workers. No, four of them in healthcare workers, and two of the healthcare workers have died. Um, the mortality rate so far is about two-thirds. Normally, the mortality rate in certain outbreaks has been as high as almost 90%. So it's a pretty fatal virus if not treated properly immediately. And there are another 23 potentially uh, potential cases that haven't been confirmed yet. So we have a pretty decent sized outbreak. Here's the problem. It's bad enough. The problem is that there is no epidemiologic link between most of the cases. So that means that there's ongoing underlying transmission in different communities that has not been identified yet. So the problem here is that it's not being taken as seriously in the local communities because there's small numbers of cases, but because there's no epidemiologic link, we think there's uh, there's subclinical, not subclinical, sorry, sub-surveillance uh, degrees of transmission. That's the uh, that's a big problem. The second big problem is there's an outbreak in Tanzania as well. And Tanzania, if you look at the map, is way on the other side. It's on the eastern coast of Africa, and they have an outbreak there as well. And I don't really have any details, unless Peter, you do, around the epidemiologic uh, factors around that. But that there are, they're trying to figure out what's going on there. That's also mostly in rural Tanzania, which is worrisome because in the rural areas, surveillance is very hard to do. So at this yeah. point, do we have to be, I'll hand it off to you. At this point here, what do we do here in the US? I think we have to be careful when we're traveling, uh, number one, to places that, and remember the other thing, as I worked quite a bit in Africa, is you can't really get from one place to another in Africa without having layovers all over the place. So there's lots and lots of places to have layovers um, in Africa. It's a very big continent. So you have to track where air flights have gone because 
Uh, you might think Equatorial Guinea is pretty well removed from where you are, but somebody may have had a layover there and for some reason they may have been exposed. It's very unlikely, but we have to be very careful. So I'll stop there. And Peter, I'm sure you have yeah. some more comments. I mean, I, I, would, I, would, I would only say before Peter starts that I agree with you, but I remind people that the biggest risk traveling to Africa are still car accidents and road accidents. <laughs> yeah. And, you know, while I worry about Marburg, I really worry a lot more when I get on the bus or in the taxi, because that's where the challenge is. That's where we, we see most of, most, most of the injury to travels. And again, take your malaria prophylaxis. You know, we all talk about risk. You okay. have to take you have to take the big thing. Yeah. Risk and just worry about this and don't worry about the other ones. But Peter, what do you have to say? No, I, I don't have much to add to what Bonnie said, except that I, I, I love how you put things in perspective, Carlos, first of all. But secondly, around Marburg, it seems weird to me that it's outbreak in Tanzania, so geographically separate from uh, Guinea. And, you know, apparently the Tanzania outbreak is a little bit more under control, but again, little information because of rural areas. And in Guinea, what I understand is like um, very little testing capacity, uh, very little um, disease surveillance. Um, and again, it really speaks to the fact that, you know, and then people are saying, well, it, it's spillover from fruit bats, so avoid fruit bats. But the good, I guess the one good thing about Marburg compared to say COVID is that there's less evidence for asymptomatic transmission. So the person is sick and that's usually through uh, blood and bodily fluids uh, transmission that way. But Again, it's it's just weird that uh, this is emerging on top of the Ebola that happened in uh, Uganda and, and um, you know last year and and you know it just seems that we're headed into more and more of these kinds of outbreaks. So the last the and I want to agree with that too. So one thing I think for all of us though, because back home I think the concern is in the ED or in the urgent care. You're going to say, oh my God, you just came back from. Africa, you have a fever. Guess what? 90% of those fevers, as uh, Carlos said, are going to be malaria. In fact, the graduate student we saw actually had malaria. So, you know, obviously you, you're very careful. You put people with fever who've traveled to high risk areas, you put them in isolation, but be very calm and collected. Just collect data and make sure that you rule out the most common things. Um, and that's going to be oh. the easy way to handle all these, any, any potential traveler. Because if we're heading into you know, spring and summer travel season. Yeah, and a lot of people are traveling. I mean, you know, planes are full, a lot of people are traveling. So going going on to a, a, a different virus and a different issue, uh, a few days ago, uh, WHO uh, was notified by, by China about a, a confirmed human case of avian influenza, influenza a, H3N8. And this is the third reported case of human infection of avian influenza H3N8. And all three cases have been reported thus far, thus far in China. So, so avian flu. Uh, I always worry about about flu, and I always worry about avian flu. And, and whenever I see these things, I worry about them. So, so what do we tell people? How how are you managing? How are you thinking about avian flu? Well, first of all, um, this is also this is the first case of H three and eight, but we've had a number of cases of H five and seven. So there are so many permutations of the HPAIs, what we call the highly pathogenic avian influenza strains. Um, I think, as you all know, people who have talked about the price of eggs uh, or the lack of eggs in markets, it's affecting our flocks. Uh, we do know that. Uh, this is a persistent outbreak um, and these birds fly. We know their migratory patterns are quite extensive. So this is something to worry about. I think this is a highly transmissible virus in birds, fortunately not in humans. Seroprevalence studies have demonstrated, at least for H5N7, that uh, there can be infection among people who handle poultry, but fortunately most of those have been asymptomatic. So I think the thing to remember is that if you see a dead bird, whatever it looks like, whether it's a crow or a, you know, or, or a chicken or any, anything that has wings and can fly, just don't go near it and report it to your local public health department. They know what to do. The second thing is um, we know that there are vaccine stockpiles for these HPAIs. So if we face a human situation where it becomes more transmissible in people, we do have stockpiles of vaccines that are ready to be put out there. And this has been going on for over 10 years. So we know that we're tracking these viruses very carefully. 
Um, you can always check on the CDC website. They have a really nice page that goes over the HPAI. So I don't know, Peter, what else you might have to add about this? The one thing I would like to add, Bonnie, and I completely agree with you, um, is that, first of all, many people think that avian flu will be the next uh, pandemic. And they've been thinking that for a while, but I think the writing is kind of on the wall at some point. But, they, you know, you need probably apart from humans interacting with these infected birds, the thing that's concerning about this year is that there have been more mammal to mammal transmissions. So it seems to have crossed the species like the outbreak in seal and um, mammals in other places that have been getting uh, avian flu. So I think that is kind of uh, worrisome to people apart from you know the birds and isolated human cases. So Peter, well, there's a question from the audience that I'm is, is for you, but I'm going to be I'm going to ask you then. You know, you say that that a lot of people find it confusing, especially in the community, when we talk about immunocompromised. How do we define immunocompromised? It's somebody with H HIV and biologically suppressed and immunocompromised. How about somebody who's getting on you know chemotherapy? Uh, at one point in time, is somebody with lupus or Crohn's immunocompromised? How do you how do you how do you define immunocompromised? Yeah, so I think of uh, immunocompromised from say a score of one to ten, and ten would be people who uh, received a stem cell transplant recently, say within the first three months, or recently organ transplant, or on any B cell depleting agents like rituximab. And the reason why I think about them differently from say the patient, the HIV patient who is on uh, antiretroviral therapy. Um, with good T cells, uh, low viral load is that they don't have the, the they can't make antibodies. Think about Colin Powell. He had multiple myeloma, which shuts down those plasma cells that make antibodies. So you can give him a million vaccines and he would not respond to the vaccines. So those are the people I'm probably most worried about. And the other thing about immune compromised individuals is that things change. So it's a dynamic landscape which is why I applaud the FDA and the CDC for giving providers the latitude for thinking about giving additional doses. Because say I have somebody who had got a stem cell transplant for leukemia or AML or something, and then maybe they had a rocky uh, first three months, but then they're out of the woods. During that rocky first three months, I might've given them a shot, a uh, COVID shot, but then uh, they didn't have the machinery really to respond. We don't have every shell. But after the fact, uh, their cells are coming back. Uh, they look to be in good shape. I can give them another shot because I know their probability of response will be higher. So that's the way we think about it. First of all, there's a difference from one to the next. Patients with diabetes, for example, uh, on one low extreme, but, but those groups that I mentioned are on the higher rate. And of course, there are lots of people in between. And we don't have great measures to say, how much immunosuppression uh, somebody has compared to another. We just have these uh, broad brushstroke kind of measures. That's why, you know, it, it, we don't have it validated yet, but informally, some people just look at, um, you know, spike protein and nucleus capsid antibodies to just kind of give you an idea. To me, it's just like, yes, no, did they respond or not? I think that's, that's very of the immunocompromised and the person with, with HIV. I wanna talk a little bit about monkeypox because I, I was impressed about the data showing how severe, how severe monkeypox could be if you have HIV and you're not virally suppressed and you have a low CD4 count. And you know when you look at the data, there have been about close to 90,000 cases of monkeypox reported globally. US has reported about a third, you know, about 30,000 or so, and we've had over 40 deaths, 40 some odd, 42 deaths of the 110 deaths globally. Uh, Europe has had about 23, 24,000 cases of monkeypox and they've only had uh, five deaths. So their mortality is a lot lower than ours. And when you look at it carefully, it's because we have a lot of people with HIV who are not in care, who are not newly, newly diagnosed still, who are not virally suppressed. And I think it talks about the importance of, of having a healthcare system, quite frankly. You know, in Europe, there's universal access to healthcare and, and the difference is shown there. But I really think that we have to do a better job of, of diagnosing, you know, diagnosing people with HIV, or in fact, getting people not to get HIV. I mean, we have to scale up PrEP so they don't get HIV and we have to do a better job. So how are you, how are you approaching? Has, has monkeypox changed the way 
you're thinking about or how aggressive we need to be with HIV. Well, can I just, I'll just make a quick comment. I'm on the ACIP uh, monkeypox working group. So I can't really talk a lot about what uh, we've been, you know, what data we have. And I'll let Peter talk about the clinical scenario for adults. But what we've been trying to do is come up with guidelines that we're going to present in the in the summertime to ACIP regarding the next steps, because we do need to be prepared to provide really good clinical guidance to practitioners, especially those who have immunocompromised patients um, or patients that otherwise at high risk. Um, and their considerations are gonna be very broad and they're gonna include lots of different populations, including hopefully pregnant people, children, um, other people who we've ass assumed have not been at risk, but just to make sure we have you know, very broad guidance for everyone. So Peter, I'll hand it off to you. Um, the only comment I'd like to make, Carlos, is first of all, like clinically seeing patients with advanced HIV AIDS who uh, have had really disseminated cases of, of MPOX and really affecting uh, quality of life, but also really leading to a lot of superficial infections, strictures, and all of that. I think the universal theme with many of these patients, like you mentioned, Carlos, is lack of access to care. Um, they're coming to the clinic or the hospital, not because of HIV, but they're coming because the MPOX was all over their bodies and it was really painful and obvious. So the failure of the healthcare system to really address them to begin with until you know, MPOX really brought them to the hospital was really symbolic of, of where we are with some patients. The, the second thing, my observation was, you know, we have uh, luckily, in the US to have access to tecovirumab. Uh, it's not widely it, and, and wasn't widely uh, available in, uh, to all centers because of initially it was a lot of paperwork and then um, the barriers were lowered, but then it became very confusing to a lot of people how to get access to tecovirumab. But uh, in many cases, if given early, again, that's the theme of viral infections. Uh, you can prevent some of these cases from becoming more serious, even in the advanced uh, HIV AIDS, AIDS group. So multifactorial, and of course, we'd like to get them before they became advanced HIV in the first place. Um, but, but I think MPOX, like you pointed out, illustrated how fractured our healthcare system is, how many disparities there are. And luckily, and I put luckily in quotes, the nidus of MPOX were in the three most liberal cities, New York, Los Angeles, and, and, and San Francisco. So there is much more alignment between public health and political leaders and health centers. But even with all of that, uh, we still had a lot of people suffer for a long time and uh, eventually uh, many, some of them died. Yeah, no, it's been, it's been really rough. And I think, you know, I, I'm worried that we will have another outbreak and we will have a continuous transmission because again, like, like COVID is a virus that is not going away, it will stay in the population and we're not gonna be able to, to eradicate it, to eliminate it. But we do have uh, vaccines and they are you know, fairly good and they're fairly effective. And again, you know, kudos also to the, to the community that has really tied their behavior and really you know, this outbreak uh, went away in a combination of, of of behavioral and, and vaccine factors, and, and those things really helped. Uh, we are at, at, a, at a difficult point in, 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 in this journey, right? We, we are, I don't know if you, but many of us are exhausted, right? We have, I think we have COVID fatigue and it's not long COVID, it's just, it's just ongoing COVID, different information, and different information then has led to, 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 losing lack of credibility because you said one thing yesterday, you're saying something different today. And most recently we saw panels of internal medicine this uh, past week had a piece about written by some pretty respectable people saying it's time to stop uh, 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 that max masking regular routine. At the same time, we had a piece in, in the infection control literature with some of the leading infection control people in the country saying, Let's not stop stop masking. So there you have two very respectable groups in two different journals saying exactly the opposite. So again, people say, you know, we can't trust you. Some people say one thing, some people say another. Uh, I want to find out what are you doing in your healthcare systems? Are you mask on, mask off? What's happening? So here at Stanford, last week we lifted the mask requirements, and so 
what's happening is, of course, if you're over at the cancer center, most people are masking there. And if you're in other parts of the hospital, people are not always masking. And I do think, as we talked about earlier, you know, yes, we can probably get back to a point where we're going to accept infections, but we want, you know, with that 16% boost rate, that's, that's a red flag. And with, and if you're in a hospital, I mean, again, we, I do infection control. We want to keep our infection rate in the hospital as low as possible because we have very high risk kids and we have very high risk adults. Um, and so we don't, we want to keep them safe. And I think, uh, you know, we are going to, we've lifted the mask mandate. We're going to, uh, we, we are healthcare workers have to be vaccinated though. They don't have to be boosted, but they have to be vaccinated and we're not allowing people with symptoms to come in. So I will have to see how that plays out. I do think based on my experience with RSV, with paraflu, with all the other viruses, we're gonna have people sneak in because they're not gonna feel sick when they walk in the door to see their family member. And then they might develop symptoms you know, later that night. So I do think there's gonna be some spillover. It hasn't happened yet. I do, a, I have a CDC sponsored respiratory virus transmission network study with seven, six other sites around the country. And we're still seeing low levels here. We, we do wastewater surveillance. We haven't seen a, an increase yet um, and we're tracking, but we'll have to see what happens. I don't know, Peter, what's going on in your neck of the woods? So uh, less than an hour away, uh, uh, Bonnie, uh, UCSF is still continuing masking in patient facing areas. And that's really uh, because the county and city of San Francisco together with Los Angeles decided to uh, continue the masks for healthcare workers in patient facing areas. So no masks necessary for visitors or um, patients, but for clinicians in, that, in those contexts, uh, they're continuing the masks for the time being. I think it's just like, the way I think about it is not pulling the plug on the stereo, but just putting the volume down a little bit. I think we're all may get there at some point, but at least for Los Angeles and San Francisco counties, uh, Healthcare workers are still wearing masks in patient facing areas, but you know, in the elevator to the car park or the students in the med school, uh, masks are not uh, required anymore. So, you know, it's not only, I mean, it's hard to come up with a national policy, right? Because, you know, it's, it's, it's the uh, states run, uh, run public health, but in the same state, we're seeing counties really run public health and counties making the decisions. So, you know, it gets down to that 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 nuisance, and again, that creates you know, there's different flavors of what we do, but that creates a lot of uh, of uh, of confusion with people. They, well, you're doing one thing, went to the southern hospital, you're doing, you guys don't know what you're doing, and everybody does something different, and that that I think contributes to to mistrust, and and so linked to mistrust is obviously the issue of of, of misinformation and and you know. Where are we with misinformation? You know, I, I feel that lately we have seen a a barrage of misinformation. We're seeing, you know, uh, uh, you know, congressional hearings on the origin of COVID. We're seeing, uh, you know, uh, the FBI and the Department of Defense saying, "Oh, we think COVID was released by by a laboratory." We see, uh, you know, all sorts of misinformation out there. And and how 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 do you how do we deal with that? How do we deal as 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 Infectious disease physicians, as as members of the community, what are you what are you doing about it? Well, so let me just point out another another article that came out yesterday from the World Health Organization. They surveyed fifty five countries around vaccination uh, uh, vaccination opinions by local families and and communities. And fifty two of the fifty five countries they saw major increases in vaccine hesitancy, at least expressed by their surveyors. But in some places, more than 30% of people, about 30% increase in reluctance to vaccine. And this is, we're talking about normal vaccines, right? We're talking, not talking about COVID. So there's a lot of spillover into our normal way of life. And I like to bring up the other fact that we have seen over the last hundred years. So since 1900, we have doubled our life expectancy. So there's a really nice book. I think I brought up before it's called second life because we've added a second life to all of us because of prevention. And I think in the heat of the moment, people forget where we are and they think they don't remember that these small little, these little small wins are actually very big wins. And so what, what has happened is uh, from HIV days, I remember in doing prevention work and prevention of mother-child transmission, 
the behavioral piece of that is very hard to manage. So managing information, people might know, first of all, they might even know the information, but acting on the information is even harder. So we know that the only factor that affected people's behavior around HIV um, safe behaviors was knowing somebody who was infected. And that's really a bad way to learn a lesson. Um, so I do agree that we need to do a better job. And, and we still see that uh, medical providers are the most trusted source of information, but it is hard, Carlos, as you said, when even our medical people have different opinions. And I do think that we need to make it clear that a science evolves, that facts, that facts, um, you know, that that the world changes over time. I mean, we don't, we're not, uh, we don't have a golden book with all of the answers written down that we're hiding from people. So I think the more we can explain, here's what my way of thinking is. This is why I think this. We frequently find out that even though we maybe in on in the big high, uh, byline or in the headline disagree that a lot of the facts are the same and it's all open to interpretation. So, uh, but but the problem is I don't see us building a good communication foundation, not only in this country, but just around the world. How do we communicate better? It's especially hard when social media really can um, move much faster than we can. So whenever somebody's tweeting, uh, something out. You can't, you can't keep up with that. So I think we just need to, you know, as societies in our different societies, this society, for example, really try to disseminate our information the best way possible, because in the end, it's always about personal relationships. It is. Uh, I mean, I, I think my perspective on this too is, is similar to Bonnie's and that communication was really such an important tool uh, that many healthcare professionals probably didn't embrace as much. I mean, you know, we, sure, I mean, Carlos, you've been very active on Twitter, for example, but I think many people felt shy or didn't realize how important it was. Uh, we don't get training in health profession school about good communication. We have with patients, but not with the community so much. Uh, maybe we need to do a better job of that. Uh, the other thing is this complete and continued misalignment between science and politics uh, in, in many senses. So if, if people are misaligned, if our political leaders are misaligned with uh, healthcare professionals, then it's then you're already behind the eighth ball. And if you look at what's happening over the country, and even that lawsuit against Fox um, for election misinformation, it's really extending to all parts of of society. And and Bonnie, I mean, the other thing that was striking to me, and first of all, and, and we have people going up for president now, even the Democratic Party, who are purveyors of misinformation. So if political leaders are going to be purveyors of misinformation, you know, we have to stay in the good fight, right? But it becomes very, very difficult, uh, particularly when you get hate messages and things like that. And then you have like legislators like Texas and Bonnie, you might've heard of this. I'm sure you have, where they're thinking about cherry picking the childhood immunizations oh, at the absolutely. legislative level. Yeah. I mean, and that was frightening to me. Mm -hmm. I mean, when did lawmakers become the, the arbiters of what, immunizations children should get uh, before going to school. You know, I, that is kind of where we are right now. It, 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 is, it is depressing, but we, we can't stop. You know, again, the price of freedom is eternal vigilance. We need to keep working at it. We need to keep going. I always look back, you know, uh, a lot of people talk about, I was bringing this up the other day, you know, the second coming by Yates. If you read that poem, everyone says we're living that. Well, we've said that ever since he wrote that poem in 1919 and probably before that, where he said, you know, the slouching beast is coming to Bethlehem. You know, we're at the, you know, the second coming is the Antichrist kind of scenario. We've lived through this before and we've gotten through it. Uh, obviously, we're going to have some, unfortunately, we're going to have some uh, casualties from people who fall into these behaviors. So we need to keep fighting that fight. We can't stop because people don't believe uh, what's going on. We don't believe the facts. And I think there will be enough people who do believe that we can continue to move forward. That's the only way we can go ahead. Absolutely. Couldn't agree with you more. So uh, so we have a question for the audience that I also was going to ask you. So I'm glad the audience uh, asked, asked the question. Uh, May 11th, the emergency, uh, you know, uh, the, the, it's the end of the public health emergency. Is it premature? Are we are we ending it at the right time? What's going to happen? Uh, are you worried about it? 
I, you know, I think it's time to incorporate this virus into our normal life. Um, we can't, you know, as you said, Carlos, you know, people have COVID fatigue and it's spilling over to other things. I think we just need to start normalizing what we're doing today. People are very adaptable, uh, especially if you make it passive for them to be adaptable. So if you don't make them do anything, you just build it into the natural system. Um, I think we just need to, you know, do a better job, as you said, about getting boosters out, making sure people are safe from not from infection, because we can't do that, I don't think, and we never could, uh, but keeping people out of the hospital. And uh, we, I think the messaging, uh, getting more, you know, again, as Peter said, bringing our communities, I, I think one of the highlights of the pandemic was more community engagement. And I think all of us can say that we are more engaged with our communities now. We can't stop now. We have to keep that up um, and really integrate that message into health equity overall. So in some ways that we can start to streamline all these processes into one, bring COVID into the picture along with everything else, because you know we live through this moment in time, uh, but it's time to move on and, and build, the, build, build some lessons into this. And hopefully people won't forget because we won't let them. I agree with Bonnie completely in terms of the right time. The one group I think we all feel a little bit nervous about, and, I'm, and, and this audience takes care of a lot of those people, yeah. are people without insurance. Mm -hmm. I think um, they wouldn't have any safety, safe, safety, you know, stopgap measures anymore. And it comes back to one of your earlier comments about uh, people with advanced uh, HIV AIDS getting uh, really severe cases of MPOX uh, where you know, it really illustrates our fragmented health system. So when you don't, when when people are going to be dropped in terms of almost 20 million from uh, Medi-Cal or Medicaid because they were automatically kept in the program, but now everybody's reevaluating whether or not they're eligible or not. So those people will unfortunately be part of the, the you know, the gap. And it just depends on where they live, what kind of services they will have. I think in California, and and certain counties, we we are a little bit luckier than some, but again, that's the group that I'm worried about the most. Well, you saw the data today from I think it was JAMA. If we looked at the top causes of death, poverty poverty is the fourth most common all by itself is the fourth most common cause of death out there: heart disease, cancer, um, and uh, smoking. So poverty all by itself as a cause of death is something that you know we have to come to grips with and. I think our disparities are starting to widen up again. Uh, we need to really shore those up. You know, a lot of the COVID uh, supplements are starting to go away, at least in California. We're going to see a lot of people evicted. Uh, people are going to lose insurance. Um, children are going to lose coverage as well. And those are the, that's the future for us. So, um, so this, is, this so is where voting and really, you know, our community engagement and advocacy really have come to play. And you, Carlos, as our leader, uh, are going to have to help us do that through um, IDSA and other organizations. A fearless so leader. So, so Bonnie, as uh, as as that article in JAMA said, yeah, poverty in one of the, in in the wealthiest country in the world is still the fourth leading cause of death, and I think that to me is is a part that is even it's more depressing, right? That we have a country that should not have poverty as a cause of death because we have the the GDP and the wealth to be able to not have that as a problem. Uh, we, we have a lot of, of, uh, of things that are going to happen uh, on the on the on November 11th and May 11th, May 12th, after the public health emergency is lifted. But a lot of things are going to stay the same in the sense that the government is is you know there's plenty of vaccines, there's plenty of Paxlovid, uh, those will remain available, um, and uh, and the government is trying to make an effort to 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 get some money to continue funding vaccines for those that don't have coverage. So because, you know, the, otherwise the price is going to be about $130 a dose and people are not going to be able to afford it. Uh, the one thing that is going to go away is your free COVID test, right? So if you haven't gotten your, your eight or whatever COVID test you can get, you can still get them now. And, and you know, you want to keep them in your closet. It's a good idea. So, you know, stack up your COVID test and you haven't gotten them. You can go and, and get your COVID test until until May 10th, I guess. That will be the last day you'll be able to get them. But, but yeah, I worry about three things. I worry about the uninsured, as was mentioned, that are going to be many of them are going to be dropped out of Medicaid and are going to lose coverage. I in the most vulnerable populations. I worry about, you know, CDC has been able to get data from the states 
uh, because of, of the emergency authorization. That's going to end. So surveillance is going to suffer. We're not going to, if you go to the CDC data, uh, you know, the COVID tracker, you're not going to get data because states can decide whether they send information or not. And, and, and that's going to be a mess. So the data issue is going to be an important one. And, and, and the last one is going to be that, that we're going to lose some of the provisions that have allowed us to do telehealth across state lines and many things that have continued to happen. So I, I wish that that we will be addressing some of those issues because quite frankly, telehealth has been very effective, but if all of a sudden I cannot do telehealth with somebody that lives in the state of Alabama, which is right around you know the next state from us, which right now I can do, it becomes a problem, right? It's gonna be an issue. And, and therefore, at the end of the day, access to care is impeded. And we know when, when access is not good, then, then people go to care once they're in desperate need. And that's when they end up in the emergency room. And that's when the care ends up being incredibly expensive. So we're-, one, we're what, what's it? Go ahead, Peter. One sidebar, I think, um, uh, Carlos, with the telehealth just reminds me of some of the health system implications, which are you know things that we take for granted, like traveling nurses, for example, if they come out of state, uh, there'll be much more, uh, you know, sort of like accreditation, licensing, et cetera, which was dropped during COVID. So I think some hospital systems I know are having a hard time with nursing, apart from the burnout issues in healthcare in general. So those would be other sort of collateral damage from the healthcare emergency, public health emergency being formally dropped. Yeah, no, for sure. Those, those are really, really important topics. So you know we're we're reaching the end of this this webinar, and I want to leave a, a few minutes for us to just have some closing thoughts and closing closing remarks of where do you see things right now, and uh, and how are you uh, thinking about the summer? Are you are you traveling? Uh, everybody else seems to be traveling. Are you traveling? Are you not? Uh, are you doing something different? I just uh, you know just went to Europe uh, to the European Congress of Microbiology, and and you know. I took some rapid tests with me and I said, you know, I, I need to be testing myself regularly. And uh, after, you know, the plane trips and coming back and, uh, and I was worried if I get infected, uh, you know, what I, would I be, access, be able to access care? So how, how, are you, how are you thinking about those kinds of things nowadays? Yeah, I've already been to Europe twice and to South America once and a lot of travel around the U.S. And actually, um, I, um, I, I have done okay. I did get, I did get infected actually for the first time a month ago, uh, on a trip in the U S and I was wearing masks on my plane. So I can only think that I got it, um, at an event that, that we were going to, and maybe somebody was pre-symptomatic. Um, but fortunately, as we said, you know, I'm boosted, um, and I hadn't got my, I haven't gotten my second booster yet, but, um, I took Paxlovid and I did fine. So, I think the issue is going to be, I mean, I'm going to keep traveling. I'm going to, I'm still going to wear my mask on the plane um, around. I mean, when I was sitting in, in the plane that I, I was coming home with, I mean, everyone was hacking and coughing and I don't care if it was COVID or not. I didn't want to catch whatever it was. So I'll probably wear my mask on the plane and in the airport, if there aren't people around me, I think I'm okay. Um, so I think my own personal uh, approach will be just to be careful. I'm, st we're still a lot more careful about, you know, distancing being careful about uh, being around people who are in fact uh, in, have symptoms of anything. And I think in the hospital, we're just going to have to deal with, as we said, we're going to have to deal with um, really going back to intense screening at the front door for people who come in the door and making sure that they're not coming in sick. Now, regarding all the things you said about health equity, um, I am the Senior Associate Dean for Faculty Development and Diversity here. And one of the areas that we've been building out is health equity research uh, for our senior and our, for all of our faculty. And we've been really trying as many other places have been to really start to understand what social determinants of health are doing. We've been looking, for example, we have a study of respiratory transmission in households and we're finding that just, you know, when you control for all other factors, people who are, live in socially vulnerable zip codes are still at much higher risk of transmitting in households than people who live in uh, high, uh, low vulnerability. So there's still a lot of health disparities as we've talked about. And I think you know what we can do as uh, academics is continue to study and bring this forward. But as policymakers, we need to make sure that all of these are incorporated into our government's 
uh, calculation. I know they really tried to do that with MPOX, for example, but we need to make sure that this is really part of the panorama for all our approaches to healthcare, especially preventative healthcare, to make sure that equities um, are reached for all of our, especially for our disenfranchised. So it's really just spurred us on, at least me here at our institution, to really try to build that into every aspect of the work we do. And, and as you said right now, you know, we talk about social determinants of health, but really what you mentioned right now is more structural determinants of health. You know, why do people live in certain zip codes? Yeah. And it's because of, of redlining. It's because of many laws that, that you know, mortgage. It was because education access. is because inadequate transportation. But I also want to remind our audience that uh, Daniel Dows, who is a, a big thinker in this area, uh, talks about political determinants of health, right? And above the structural determinants of health mm -hmm. are political determinants of health, which are voting, government, and policies. And I, I always tell people, you know, any policy is health policy. And at the end of the day, many of the policies that we're seeing enacted in many states are actually impacting health. And they're policies that have to do with who can vote and where can you live and, you know, whether you have access to education. And I'm, I'm you know, we're seeing right now, for example, the Supreme Court getting ready to make a very important decision about whether you can use, you know, uh, race as a uh, an ethnicity as a as a this, as a as a factor in decision of admission to universities, you know that will be a policy issue that will impact who can get into higher education, who can get a better job, and therefore determines health. Again, it goes back to this whole issue of poverty as a as a determinant of health. So, so I think one of the things that we need in our institutions is not only to to do research about social determinants of health, but we need to do interventions and we need to again be be active be do advocacy to really change uh, the the political determinants of health because if not i feel like we're like you know salmon you know swimming up the river you're going against the current and you're never going to end up uh, doing anything useful so peter last three minutes last comments my last comments is i'll continue to be humble uh, about this virus um, i'm thinking our next surge will be in the winter we may have little spikes here and there uh, but I'll just continue to watch and be and be careful as much as possible. I'm not wearing my mask in most situations anymore, but like Bonnie, I have it available. I'm still wearing it in at work in the hospital. <clears throat> I think um, I will continue to be as as an activist as I can. I became kind of a uh, mini activist during COVID, and I think all of your conversations really resonate right. with me and continue to communicate well with um, or think about communication, empathic communication with. Patients, even if they don't subscribe to my views um, as much as I can, although it's really, really difficult. And, and I would just say that one, one thing that I tell people, I tell friends and tell colleagues, family members, that if you get infected, it's not a sign of weakness, it's not a sign of, of a fault. You know, as, as Tony Fauci said to me when he got infected, he said, this virus is like a heat-seeking missile, you know, it will find you. So you will get infected despite, the, as Bonnie said, wearing your mask, et cetera. But if you're vaccinated and boosted, you're going to do okay, and if you are eligible for Paxlovid, you get therapy. You're going to be even better, even though your your mouth is going to taste pretty bad for a while. And uh, and at the end of the day, uh, you know, it's it's we're going to learn to live with this virus, and we're going to get on because we're all very resilient. So thank you. I want again to want to thank uh, uh, Bonnie. I want to thank uh, Peter. This is a incredibly uh, useful com conversation. Every time I learn something different, and I really value their their insights and their thoughtfulness. Uh, I want to uh, to remind everybody that the uh, the IAS USA has uh, many many educational activities. The next one coming up is the annual HIV update that's going to occur in Chicago on May the fifth, with some really uh, good talks and uh, and excellent speakers. And we will be doing uh, uh, an, a, a variety of different webinars. There's going to be one on 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 update on Croy. There's going to be one on prevention. And I'm very excited about this one that I'm, I'm co-chairing with my friend uh, Dr. Judy Courier that we're gonna do on June 20, uh, 22nd is gonna be a webinar, a, a, a four hour webinar, a virtual course on long COVID and a lot of discussions about long COVID. So we put this together and I really encourage you to attend. Thanks for participating and uh, and please, uh, you know, give us some suggestions, email us, visit the IAS USA website and we're always here to provide, to provide up-to-date information. So have a good evening. Bravo, you guys. Thank you. That was amazingly interesting. That was fun. Thanks. Thanks, everybody. That was great.
Thank Have you. Have a good weekend if we don't talk to you in between. You too. Bye. 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 Stay safe, everyone.